as uh, yesterday's gospel said. And, uh, and uh, here I am, giving God what is God's in another way, uh, through, uh, through prayer and through catechesis. Um, I'm going to, um, to start today a new chapter of Dies Domini. Uh, I'm going to talk about how the day of the Lord is actually the day of the church also. Um, so there's, um, there's quite, uh, quite, quite an interesting new, uh, new chapter that we're going to go into. Hi, Carol. Thank you for joining. So I'm going to start with uh, our noon prayer and the Angelus prayer. Um, actually, I don't know if you knew, uh, I'm going still to wait a little bit um, for others to join. I don't know if you were aware, but uh, the Angelus prayer um, was, uh, um, is linked in a particular way with the month of October because it is um, in the month of October we celebrate uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. And uh, that, that, that Feast of the Blessed Mother is... Um, is, um, is because of the Battle of Lepanto, which was one of the greatest battles between Christianity and, um, and the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the threat of, of uh, the Ottoman Empire um, conquering Europe and Western Europe was, was huge. So uh, uh, the Pope, I believe it was Innocent, uh, Innocent III, I'm not sure exactly. No, I think it was St. Pius V. Who, uh, who asked uh, all Christians throughout all the Christianity to pray three times a day, morning, noon, and evening, um, to pray uh, this prayer that was commemorating the incarnation of the Lord, uh, the coming of the Lord in the flesh um, in our world. And, uh, and so the, that's, that's where the tradition also ringing the bells early in the morning, um, at noon, and at sunset. So um, this prayer, the Angelus, um, has a deep connection, therefore, with this feast uh, in the victory uh, uh, at Lepanto, uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. Um, and, um, and that is, um, yeah, so what we're doing this in the month of October, um, which is the month of the Rosary. And, and this Angelus, this Marian prayer, is, uh, is, is, uh, has a strong connection with, uh, with Mary and with, with the month of October. So let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ your Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, welcome to uh, a new installment of Dies Domini, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, holy lunch breaks in, in, during this fall. And uh, we're reading through this apostolic letter of John Paul II. If you want to follow through um, the text, uh, just, um, just Google Dies Domini, the first Latin words of uh, this, uh, this uh, letter of John Paul II. You find it easily on the Vatican website. And, um, and we're reading uh, this time um, the beginning of chapter 3. Um, and that is how, um, how the, the day of the Lord is the day of the church, Dies Ecclesiae. So the first chapter... Uh, focuses on the very name, Dies Domini, how it is the day of the, the Lord. Um, the second chapter, Dies Christi, how it is particular, not just the day of God, the Lord's day, but the day of Jesus Christ and, and what that means. So 
we looked at various aspects of, of uh, um, the connection with Christ. So this, uh, this chapter 3 focuses on the relationship between the day of the Lord and the church, um, the community, the Christian community. So, uh, so let's go directly into it. There's a lot of good things to, great things to learn. Um, and, um, and I'm going to go directly into uh, paragraph 30 first. So the Eucharistic Assembly, the heart of Sunday. I am with you always to the end of the age. This promise of Christ, and this, the quote is from Matthew 28, 20, never ceases to resound in the church as the fertile secret of her life and the wellspring of her hope. So this promise of Christ to be with us every day, always, until the end of the age, is uh, never ceases to resound in the church as the fertile secret of her life. Just think about the depth of that word. So that is the secret of the life of the church which makes us fruitful as church. This promise of Christ to, to be with his church, to be with, with his disciples. Uh, and it resounds in the church. Um, it is also the wellspring of the church's hope. So every time we gather, we, we proclaim just by our gathering, we proclaim that Christ is with us and Christ is present in our midst, right? Remember uh, Christ's uh, uh, promise where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm, I am in their midst. So by gathering as the church, especially in the Sunday assembly, we just by doing that, we proclaim that Christ is present in our midst and Christ is faithful to his promise. So as the day of resurrection, Sunday is not only the day of remembrance of a past event. It is a celebration of the living presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his own people. So Sunday is not just the remembrance of a past event. We don't just gather to remember Christ's resurrection. We don't just gather to remember what God has done for us. Actually, by our gathering on Sunday as church, as the church, we are celebrating the living presence of the risen Christ. So we don't just remember Christ, think of Christ. Christ actually becomes present in our midst as he promised, in the midst of his own people, the risen Lord, just like as he did with his apostles, just as he did with, with the early Christian community. Um, you know, he appears to them. He was present in their midst and he was present in their midst, especially on Sundays, the first day of the week. This is among the first witnesses of Christ's resurrection. That's what we have from the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles in the, uh, the New Testament. For this presence to be properly proclaimed and lived, it is not enough that the disciples of Christ pray individually and commemorate the death and resurrection of Christ inwardly in the secrecy of their hearts. Those who have received the grace of baptism are not saved as individuals alone but as members of the mystical body, having become part of the people of God. So this is a very important point, that um, it is not enough that as Christians that we pray individually, that we pray on our own. We know, right, Christ says, like, when you pray, go into your room, um, and in the secret, um, uh, your Father will see you. It's like, pray to your Father, um, you know, so... That, that, that invitation of Christ to, um, to pray individually is part of our Christian life, right? Um, um, it, it is important, it is essential, actually, that we have a personal relationship with the Lord. If we don't have that, there's something missing in our life. But in the same time as Christians, in the, at the same time, it is not enough to pray individually. It is not enough to have that only that individualistic relationship with the Lord. Actually, what we discover, if we really encounter the Lord in prayer, in, in personal prayer, if we really have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ inevitably draws you to the others, opens you to the others. So you, you, you want to reach out even more. And, and so it draws you to a community, inevitably. Um, otherwise, it's not, it's not is not the God of Jesus Christ that we're encountering in prayer if, if all we're doing is, is wanting to be individualistic. Even, even those who have a monastic 
um, vocation, even those who, um, you know, the cloistered, um, the cloistered nuns, um, they still have some aspect of community prayer. And, and even when they pray individually, the understanding is that the, the, the church is spiritually present in their prayer and they pray for the church and they are part of the church and they're united to the church. Just in the same way, um, you know, um, that we were during the lockdown, that we were praying individually, we were praying in our homes. I was praying on my own and celebrating Mass alone. It's not truly that I was praying individ in an individualistic way, that I was celebrating Mass, but it was always spiritually, the church was, was present, you were present, um, we were united. So this is important to, an important aspect of our faith to, um, to understand. For this presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his own people to be properly proclaimed and lived, says John Paul II, it is not enough that the disciples of Christ pray individually and commemorate the death and resurrection of Christ inwardly in the secrecy of their hearts, right? It is not enough as a Christian to say, I celebrate Christ's resurrection in my home, in my own, um, you know, in, uh, alone, and that's it, right? Um, that has to be an exception um, dictated by, by, by exceptional um, uh, circumstances, right? Um, it cannot be normal, right? So those who have received the grace of baptism are not saved as individuals alone, but as members of the mystical body, having become part of the people of God. So just think about the baptism. Uh, the, nobody gives uh, themselves the baptism, right? We are baptized by someone else and by, we are baptized by, by a member of the church. Um, you know, in, it's in extraordinary circumstances, you know, everyone can baptize, not just, um, not just a priest and a deacon. So, um, but, you know, that, so by the fact that we are baptized, we receive a sacrament that is the sacrament of the church. Um, we are receiving baptism from the church. So by, by being baptized, we are not just brought into, uh, into a new relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, but we're actually brought into a relationship with, with God's people, also the mystical body of Christ, the people of God. So we become a living part of the people of God, members of the mystical body of Christ. Um, so we are not saved just as individuals alone. It is important, therefore, that they come together to express fully the very identity of the church, the ecclesia, that is a Greek word meaning the church, the assembly called together by the risen Lord who offered his life to reunite the scattered children of God. Now that is, that is a, um, a reference to John eleven fifty two, 52, where it says that the work of salvation um, of Jesus Christ is expressed as, um, as reuniting the scattered children of God. But when you think about, about that image of being scattered, being divided, um, that is actually uh, starts in, in, um, in the Bible with Babel, with this project of building a, wor a world um, a world without God and how the effect of that is division and people are not understanding themselves anymore. They do not speak the same language, which is, which is to say that um, they, they don't understand each other anymore and there is division because uh, there is this attempt of humanity to build itself without God um, and, and the result is, is division. The result is not greater unity. So Christ has come to counteract that movement started with Babel, um, that movement of division, to gather us together. So the word church comes from the Greek ecclesia. That means the gathered assembly, the called assembly. Um, uh, the, the, the verb that, that, that is at the bottom of, the, uh, of this word, ecclesia, is to call, to be called. So we are called, we are called by God, not just individually, but are called together. So this is, this is an important aspect of the faith that, um, that, that um, I, I wonder sometimes how, how, much, um, how much Christians understand, realize the importance of this aspect of our faith. That we are not just saved individually in an individualistic way, 
um, but we are saved to yes um, as persons but as part as of the body of Christ the mystical body of Christ as living members of the people of God they have become one in Christ right this is this is what we've become in being baptized one in Christ through the gift of the Spirit this unity becomes visible when Christians gather together it is then that they come to know vividly and to testify to the world that they are the people redeemed drawn from every tribe and language and people and nation that is uh, that quote comes from the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 so what St. John was 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 seeing uh, was seeing in heaven this assembly of the saved ones the redeemed who were gathered from every tribe and language and people and nation so what we do what we do as church when we gather together with all our differences our racial differences our ethnic differences um, our um, you know all the differences that exist in the world we come together as one as the church united by the faith in Christ united by the Lord and um, and that is how how we we testify to the fact that Christ has come to gather us to make us one one in him and and to receive the, the one Holy Spirit and and to profess the one faith the assembly of Christ's disciples embodies from age to age the image of the first Christian community which Luke, Luke gives as an example in the Acts of the Apostles when he recounts that the first baptized believers devoted themselves to the Apostles teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers so that's what we read in Acts 2 42 we, we read that the first baptized believers, the first Christian community, gathered um, because they, as they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So just think about the readings at Mass. Um, we read from the apostles. We read from the scriptures. Um, so we, that's, that's what we do. And fellowship, so the, the, the aspect that we gather as a community and and, and we grow in, in charity with one another, in a relationship with one another. And uh, the breaking of the bread and prayer and the prayers. Now, this breaking of the bread is actually the technical term which, which the early church called what we call the Mass, or in other um, uh, Byzantine Christians called the Divine Liturgy. Um, the um, um, Syriac Christians and uh, Syro Malabarese uh, Christians from 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 India, they call Kurbana uh, the whole the most holy, um, the most holy thing. Um, so Christians throughout in different places have called um, uh, the Eucharist in different ways, but the earliest way that we find in the Acts of the Apostles already is called the breaking of bread. Um, and that is the technical term. The Eucharistic Assembly. Uh, I'm reading now through paragraph 32. The Eucharist is not only a particularly intense expression of the reality of the church's life, but also, in a sense, its fountainhead. The Eucharist feeds and forms the church. So I will stop here because there's, uh, this is something that we're not used to, to reflect upon. So we think that the Eucharist is made by the church, right? We gather at Mass, and because we gather, and because it is presided by, or, by an ordained minister as presbyter, as priest, or bishop, um, that is what confects the Eucharist. That, those are the ter technical terms that we use. So priests and bishops confect the Eucharist by celebrating Mass and by... by um, by following um, the, the, the prayer of the church, Christ becomes presence with his body and blood and the Eucharistic elements of bread and wine become consecrated into Christ's body and blood, soul and divinity. So we're used to this, to thinking, okay, the priest and the bishop makes, right, confects the Eucharist. So while this is true, we have to consider another aspect that it's also the Eucharist which makes the church, not just the church makes the Eucharist. So the Eucharist makes the church. The Eucharist feeds 
and forms the church. So by feeding us, by coming into our midst, Christ, the risen Christ, he feeds and forms us and makes us church. So the Eucharist is not just a particularly intense expression of the reality of the church's life, but also in a sense, it's fountainhead. That is, that is, a, that is a, a picture, you know, that, that, that I bet we, we, uh, we haven't considered. Um, we may, so, uh, some of you may have heard about it, but it's, it's something that, that, that is a very deep, very important aspect that not just, the, not just uh, the Eucharist is made by the church, is made present by the church, but also the Eucharist forms and feeds the church. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. That is, um, that is a quote from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. So we all partake of the one bread. It is true that, um, that over the course of the centuries, both in the East and in the West, um, we, 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 have, um, we have prepared the Eucharistic bread in such a way that it's already formed right in the west we use the hosts and they're already um, they're already uh, made uh, as separated and it is that is only for a functional aspect for a fun functional reason you know in the east it is literally taken off mostly of one bread depending of how many people are going to receive communion in um, especially in the orthodox churches um, communion is is more rare um, depending on, on the, the, the various um, churches. Communion is usually more rare. People go to Mass, um, go to the Divine Liturgy, uh, but, but not everybody receives communion at every Mass. Um, and and um, so, but normally the priest prepares the Eucharist from one bread, which is in the shape of the cross. It's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, and a beautiful uh, tradition. The priest takes parts, parts of that, uh, parts of that bread uh, with with a, a special knife um, and 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 puts it on on the discos. It's like a disc uh, uh, that the pattern, and um, it, it is prepared in a, in a certain way. But again, the origin is one bread, and in our case, um, we Roman Catholics we use uh, we use the host. But again, this is just for facility um, of, of use. We don't have to break. We don't have to, uh, you know, to, to handle so many fragments. It is easier to purify um, all the fragments um, after, after distributing Holy Communion. So it is just for, for ease uh, of use. Um, that's the only reason why we have the host. But the image remains nonetheless of the one bread so because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Because of this vital link with the sacrament of the body and blood of the Lord, the mystery of the church is savored, proclaimed, and lived supremely in the Eucharist. Now, this is, um, this is, another, uh, this is a quote from another uh, letter of uh, St. John Paul II. So because of this vital link, of the church with the sacrament of the body and blood of the Lord, the mystery of the church, so not just the Eucharist, but also the mystery of the church in, in participating in the Eucharist is savored. So we taste something of the mystery of the church. The mystery of the church is proclaimed, is, is made, made obvious, it's, it's, it's visible, and lived supremely in the Eucharist. So not just lived in the Eucharist, but supremely. This ecclesial dimension intrinsic to the Eucharist is realized in every Eucharistic celebration. So an ecclesial dimension, that is the as the church, is intrinsic to the Eucharist, how this is realized in every Eucharistic celebration. So every time once a Mass is celebrated, also the mystery of the church emerges. Um, it is more obvious, um, obviously, when we do that in a, in, as, as a community. But it is expressed most especially on the day when the whole community comes together to commemorate the Lord's resurrection. Significantly, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that the Sunday celebration of the Lord's Day and His Eucharist is at the heart of the Church's life. 
So just think about, when you think about the church's life, right? We, we, think, we think of, what do you think of, the first and foremost thing, when you think of the, the, the life of the church, right? You think about our Sunday gathering at Mass. So, and that is on a Sunday. That is on the Lord's Day. So the Sunday celebration of the Lord's Day and the Eucharist on this day is at the heart of the church's life. So if this is at the heart of church's life, this is not to say that, that our things are not important, that our life of charity is not important, that our relationships are not important, that um, you know, other, other aspects, you know, the, 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 the learning aspects, that, that you know, by coming together and by listening to the apostles' teaching and to the scriptures and the homily, right? Uh, people say sometimes, uh, you know, it's important to receive a good message and, uh, you know, from, from the priest. It's much more than just a good message that we gather for, for even if that is, that, is, that is good and beautiful, um, right? We gather for much more than that because what we do is at the heart of the church's life. Now, if this is at the heart of the church's life, as uh, the catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, um, you, if you want to know the, 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 what the church believes, what's the faith of the church, you go to the catechism. That's the simplest form, the sim simplest explanation uh, of what the church believes, what we believe as, as, um, as uh, Christian Catholics. So if this is at the heart of the church's life, what is it like? If we take away that heart, right? Can one live without the heart? In the same way, the church cannot live with it, with it, with celebrating the Lord's Day, and in this Lord's Day to celebrating the Eucharist. It's like taking a heart, the heart, by striping one of one's heart. So this is part of why why this is so important that that we rediscover how essential the Eucharist is for our life and for the life of the church. It, it, is, it is so important, like the heart in a body. And the heart, the image of the heart, which pumps the blood into the whole body and, 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 and keeps the, the brain um, right, the, the oxygenated. And like, just think about the function of the heart in a body and how, how essential the heart is. And what is, what is someone without a heart? In the same way, we cannot think of the church. So I think, I think we, we have to think about this also as, as uh, members, individual members of, of the body of the church. When we are missing at Mass, we're not, when we are not celebrating the Lord's Day, then we are, we are striping the church away from the stripe like taking away the heart from the church and and we are not at the heart um, we are not part of this heart of the church so this is um, this is this is particularly uh, sad right when you think about this there's an image of life in the image of death uh, what do you want to be do you want to be a living member of of Christ's body of the church do you want to be the heart of the church do you want to be that pulsating heart or, 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 or not? What do you want to be as, as Christian? At Sunday Mass, um, this is paragraph 33 that we're le I'm reading. At Sunday Mass, Christians relive with particular intensity the experience of the apostles on the evening of Easter when the risen Lord appeared to them as they were gathered together. Right. So we know that Christ appeared to the apostles on, in, on the evening of the first day of the week, that is, that is uh, Sunday. So at Sunday Mass, by gathering, we relive with particular intensity what the apostles lived and witnessed. So um, then, in a sense, the people of God of all times were present in that small nucleus of disciples, the first fruits of the church. So through their testimony, Every generation of believers hears the greeting of Christ, rich with the messianic gift of peace, won by his blood and offered with his spirit. Peace be with you. So that is, we find that in John 20, right? There's the risen Lord appeared to the apostles. And the first words that the risen Christ said was, peace be with you. So um, that is one of the, one of the expressions that we find, um, we find quite often in the liturgy. 
right? The first greeting of the priest or, um, or the bishop, whoever is presiding um, the liturgy, um, or the deacon too, uses that, that formula um, in the liturgy, um, uh, the peace be with you, or the Lord be with you. So that is that is reminiscent of um, actually that is reminiscent of of Christ's um, appearance uh, to the apostles, um, the risen Lord. Um, actually, um, we we say the Lord be with you, um, priests and deacons. The bishop says peace be with you. So the bishop is the successor of the apostles. So probably there is a link here. Uh, between this um, th this proclamation of the risen Lord to the apostles and the fact that only the apostles greet the people of God at Mass with peace be with you. Christ return among them a week later, and that is, uh, we find that um, when Christ appeared again to the apostles and Thomas was also with them, can be seen as a radical pref uh, prefig prefiguring, I, I'm not sure uh, the English pronunciation, prefiguring or prefiguring, I'm, I'm not sure about this, of the Christian community's practice of coming together every seven days on the Lord's Day or Sunday. So the fact that Christ appeared the, on the first day of the week to the apostles. Then a week later, so and again, the first day of the week, the Christ appears again to, uh, to the apostles. So we see a pattern of Christ wanting to appear to the apostles in a special way on the first day of the week. So we see in this a prefiguration of the Christian's community practice of coming together every, every seven days on the Lord's Day or Sunday in order to profess faith in his resurrection and to receive the blessing which he had promised. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That is what Jesus said to St. Thomas in John 20, 29. So we, by gathering and without seeing the risen Lord in the same way St. Thomas did and uh, the apostles, uh, we, we, we feel this blessedness. We receive this blessing from the Lord. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. This close connection between the appearance of the risen Lord and the Eucharist is suggested in the Gospel of Luke in the story of the two disciples of Emmaus. So we see in the Gospel of John that Christ appears regularly on Sunday, the first day of the week, to the apostles. But in the Gospel of Luke, we have this, uh, this, this famous passage of Christ appearing, and again, it's on a Sunday, uh, to, the, the, uh, to the disciples of Emmaus, uh, whom Christ approached and led to understand the Scriptures, and then sat with them at table. So when you think of Mass, and, and the way all liturgy is, not just Mass, there's always a reading, a proclamation of the Word of God, and uh, there's, uh, and then we come in Mass, we come to, to, to the altar, and we celebrate the Eucharistic liturgy. So there are two, two parts of Mass, if you wish. It's the liturgy of the Word, the first part, and then, and then, the, um, and then the, the Eucharistic liturgy. So, uh, so it's kind of what we, the Church does what Christ did that day by walking along with the, with the two disciples of Emmaus and explaining to them the scriptures, right? That is why we proclaim the scriptures, that, that's why we have a homily. So what the priest or the deacon or the bishop is doing by delivering a homily is actually the function of Jesus Christ who explained, unfolded the scriptures to the apostles. Um, that is, um, that is um, the homily is, is part of mass. Um, on Sunday and Sundays and feast days, it is mandated. It is mandatory, um, and um, and and that is because it is so important that as we gather, we not just read, proclaim the word of God. Um, we can read it on our own at home, right? We can we can read the Bible at home, but why do we do that as church? Why do we do that as an assembly? Why do we hear it actually proclaimed by by someone else? Right? We can all be, be, be reading it on our own in silence, but we don't do that in church. The Word of God is proclaimed, and, and then it, it is explained by, by the minister uh, of Christ, uh, the ordained minister of Christ. And, and that is, uh, that is uh, what Christ did with the disciples of Emmaus. And then interestingly, in this, passion, in this pa pa uh, passage, uh, the disciples themselves says, uh, like, 
uh, come and stay with us, remain with us, for it is evening. Uh, remain with us. They loved hearing what they were hearing, and, and they, they wanted to continue this, the, this, this, this good company that they were, they were enjoying, this company that gave them hope, gave them, right, they, they, the Lord was, was showing them how actually what happened to Christ uh, was, was prophesied by the, by, by the, um, in the Old Testament and all the prophets and, and the, the Old Testament, how they, they, they announced everything that was going to happen to Christ. So Christ gives them a new hope um, and, and, and in, in, um, by, by, by his, um, his explanation. And so then, then, then from that, they move to uh, the breaking of bread. Again, you see this technical term of the breaking of bread. And the Lord mysteriously, he disappears right at the break, breaking of bread because it, it's there that, that the Lord wants to, um, it's, that's another, another sign another, um, of how Christ wants to encounter us, the risen Lord. He wants to encounter us through the Eucharistic signs of the breaking of bread. That is where he wants us to see him and to receive him. Um, and it's the same Lord who has prepared to that uh, by, by the explanation of the scriptures. So uh, John Paul II says, um, they recognized the disciples of Emmaus, they recognized him when he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. So this is the quote, the exact quote from Luke 24, 30. So not just, you hear these words at every mass that the priest says, he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it, gave it to them. So um, those are very technical words. So we know that the, go that we know that the gospels were not written immediately. No, no, uh, no evangelist, no apostle wrote, um, wrote the, um, any of the writings of the New Testament uh, right away, right? The first, the first thing that the church did, the early church, they proclaimed Christ. They, they, and it was an oral transmission of the faith. And then later on, they put it in writing. And, and um, at times, it was, it was decades after uh, what they have witnessed. So um, when, when St. Luke wrote um, the Acts of the Apostles, uh, St. Luke wrote one book, and that is the Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it, was, it was artificially, it is artificially divided. In, 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 the, in, the, in the book, um, in the New Testament, but we have to, to, to keep in mind that it's, it's all one writing, um, you know, the, 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 the Gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it, is, it is continuing into the Acts of the Apostles, the Gospel according to Luke. So, um, in that sense, the Acts is too a Gospel, it, it, because the, the, it's a continuum. So, um, so the church was already doing that. The church was already celebrating Mass. Um, and when St. Luke wrote uh, the Acts of the Apostles, these words had a special meaning because these were the words that were used at every Mass by every Apostle and by, by every uh, presbyter who, who celebrated, uh, celebrated the Mass and the bishops they ordained. Um, so he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. So, um, so it's, it's actually, it, it first came the Mass, so to speak, and then the, then the Scripture, right? And then, then this verse that, that we quote here from, from uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, no, actually, this is the Gospel according to Luke, sorry. Um, so, um, so that's what, what comes first. So this te these technical terms point out clearly towards the Eucharist and the celebration at Mass. The gestures of Jesus in this account are his gestures at the Last Supper, with the clear allusion to the breaking of bread, as the Eucharist was called by this first generation of Christians. So, um, so I'm going to stop here uh, for, for this, um, this uh, part of, of our uh, weekly catechesis. Um, it's... Um, I, 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 this is just the, the, um, the intro to how the Eucharist um, is, uh, how, how the celebration of, 
the Lord's Day is actually also the celebration of the church. And, um, and we, we will continue um, the next couple of weeks to, to read through this chapter third, um, the Dies Ecclesiae. And um, I hope you, you, um, I hope you, you uh, learned something that, uh, that helps you uh, appreciate and celebrate appropriately the depth and the beauty um, uh, of, uh, of the celebration of the Lord's Day. So I wish you a blessed week and uh, see you next Monday. Uh, for the next installment of Dies Domini. I will conclude as always with a blessing for you and uh, all the people, all your, your family and friends uh, that you carry in your heart and you, um, you pray for them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Through the intercession of Saint Luke and the North American martyrs whom we celebrate today, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed week and see you next Monday. God bless.